to get through, so I'm going to get started. Welcome to my talk about JNet5. Um, my name is Mark Philipp. I'm from Germany. I work as a software engineer at Gradle, so those of you who have seen my talk yesterday probably already know that. I've been a JNet committer since 2012, and I'm the JNet team lead since 2016. So that means both JNet4 and the JNet5 project. Before we start, I'd like to do a quick show of hands. So please raise your hand if you have ever written a test using JNet before. Yeah, that's almost everyone, that's good. Who has used JNet5 before? Okay, quite a few, but not, not all of you, so that's good if you're in the right talk to learn more about it. Um, so the good news is JNet5 has been released, and um, this is actually, the first release was in 2017, after almost two years of work, we released JNet5, and um, since then we have, every few months, we have released a new feature release, um, and we really we are try really trying to keep up this pace to add new features in every feature release, and of course there are some bug fix releases in between, so we really try to have a more frequent release cadence than um, JNet4 had, and um, yeah, add interesting and and um, useful things every time. The agenda for today is um, first of all we're going to look at JNet Jupyter, um, which is the new testing. API for test authors, how to write tests and extensions. Then we are going to learn about the JNet platform and why we need such a thing. And last but not least, I will show you which features are still missing or what we are currently working on and give you the resources to get you started, um, to get your hands dirty with JNet. All right, so first of all, JNet Jupyter, the new testing framework for Java. So you might ask yourself, Jupyter. Why, why Jupyter? What's with the name? Is writing tests rocket science now? I can assure you it's not. It's still pretty simple. Uh, basically, we needed a new name to distinguish the different parts that are now JNet5. Um, that's basically the, the reason for a separate name. It's not just the version number. And also, it's the fifth planet from the sun. So there's a small reference to the number five, but if we ever release JNet6, we might keep the name Jupyter, for example. All right, so without much further ado, I will just jump into some coding demo. So this is a small local project. I'm just going to show the dependencies here. This is a Gradle project, um, a very basic one, just uses the Java plugin and pulls in the Jupyter dependency here and configures the Gradle test task to use the JNet platform. Once we've done that, we can write our first, first test this a little bigger here. Okay. So I have created this empty class here. It's called list test or list tests. So basically I want to write tests for the list interface in Java or some implementation thereof. I'm going to create a new test method. And as you've seen, IntelliJ already knows about JNet5. So you can pick that. And the difference basically here is it's still an annotation called test, but it's from a different package. It's no longer just org JUnit, it's org JNet Jupyter API. And then you can just name your test like you used to. I'm going to like adding an element, whichever you co convention you want to use here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a list of strings. And I'm going to use an array list. And then I'm going to add an element to it. Let's call it foo. And I'm going to assert something. I'm going to assert that foo is the first element in the list. I need to import that. And yeah, here's another small difference to JNet4. It, there's also a class that has all the static assertion methods, but it's now called assertions, no longer just assert. And it's also in the Jupyter API package. Okay, once we've done that, we can execute our first test. It runs on JNet5. So as you can see, you still have the, the test view you used to. You can navigate to the test. It's all pretty simple. So there's nothing really new in the simple test. And for most of your tests, probably you don't have to use all the advanced features we now provide. But for some cases, you will have. And this is why I'm showing you 
them today to you. Um, so one thing is you can now name your tests um, in a more flexible manner. You're no longer restricted to the method name syntax. So you can, uh, for example, say, um, yeah, can add an element, for example, or list, or can use the same thing on a class level. You can say, okay, this is a test for a list, so I'm describing a list, kind of. And when I'm executing this again, you will see this these names here that are a little more readable than the, the method names. So a list can add an element. And you can still navigate here. If you tried something like that in JNet4, it would break the ID integration to a certain degree. You could no longer jump to the to the source of the test. All right. Let's add another test. This time let's remove something. Okay, I need another list. Um, I could copy this. I'm just going to refactor it into a field declaration. Okay, so now I have this. doesn't need to be final. could be, but I'm not really concerned with that right now. So let's just remove something from a list. What will happen? Exception, yeah. Exactly. Well, let's, let's see it. Okay, of course it throws an exception because there's no element in an empty list. Right. Okay, maybe that's actually a case I want to test. So how do we test exceptions in, in Jane and Jupyter? We no longer have the expected parameter on the test annotation. This is just a plain annotation here. No, no parameters or attributes on it. Um, so what do we do instead? We can write an assertion. So basically, it's a, since we now can, Jupyter is based on, on uh, Java 8, we can use lambdas, for example. So we no longer have to um, yeah, do fancy stuff with annotations if we don't need to. And in this case, I'm just going to like move this code around and do it in here. So there's a new an a new assertion called assert throws that you can specify the exception that you expect, and basically back here the the block of code that you expect to throw this exception. All right. So let's let's run this again. I think I heard already it's going to fail. Yes, because I'm expecting the wrong exception type, so unexpected exception type thrown, expected no such element exception, that's here. But we got an index of one exception, so that was obviously wrong. Let's fix that. Run it again. Okay, that works. What else can you do? Um, so it throws returns the exception actually, so you can assign it to a local variable. Let's call it exception. And this is one of the places I would use var if I if I can, um, because I don't need to repeat the type; it's already here. Um, and now I can use something like I don't know, assert not null, or I could check the actual message of the exception. But in this case, it's not actually that important. So let's just say okay, just for the purposes of demonstration, assert not null. And yeah, we can run that. And you can use any assertion library you, you want down here. It doesn't have to be uh, the assertions class of JUnit. As long as it throws an exception, that's fine. It's, it's a basic construct, construct here. And even for our own test suite in JUnit, uh, we use assert J. So feel free to pick whatever you want. Hamcrest, assert J, truth, what have you. Um, OK, what else is new? We can customize display names. I, I showed you that. But just recently, we introduced um, something that's called Display Name Generator. And that makes it sometimes a bit more convenient. So you can write your own Display Name Generator. There's a couple built-in ones. I'm going to use replace underscores. And if I do that, I can actually get rid of this and make this the method name, kind of. However, Java does not allow white space in here, so I can use this. And these are the underscores that get replaced if I execute this again. right? If I really want to make the report readable, that's a simple way to do that. You could do all kinds of fancy things here, like uh, pull apart the camel casing and do whatever you want, or prefix everything with a list. Everything's possible. Um, this is an extensible API. Uh, this one is very simple. The implementation basically just, I can show you that. All it does is this. Yeah, basically it replaces 
underscore with white spa with space. So that's really just a demonstration implementation. There's currently no built-in implementation that that knows how to how to deal with camel case, for the simple reason that sometimes uh, well there's different conventions how to how to deal with um, abbreviations in camel case. Think about I don't know XML or something. Do you do you write the M and L in lower case or in upper case or stuff like that, which would make it a little bit tricky to do so. So this is just what we currently have, but of course, if you have a good idea that what should be in the core, you can submit it, but if you just want it for your project, you might as well just implement it on your own. It's a simple interface that you need to implement. Okay, what else? Um, also recently, we added uh, test method order, so you can now influence the order of tests. Why would you want to do that? For example, to make sure that you actually don't depend on the order. So you can like use a random order for your test cases. Right, if I run this two times, I should probably get a different order. Yes. <laughs> um, as you can see, this one is now before that one, and then the previous run, it was the other way around. Um, yeah, so you can randomize the order. Or if you have integration tests, sometimes you might want to actually have a defined order in your test class. Um, think, for example, if you have a REST interface, you want to create some resource and you want to do, do something with it and you want to delete it again in the end, something like that. It's very new and, and, and kind of controversial because, of course, the, the unit, test, unit testing says don't do that ever at all. Um, but randomizing it is a valid use case, for example, and some integration tests are as well, in my opinion. Okay. I don't hear anyone screaming, so I'm going to continue. Um, another thing that's new, the test instance um, lifecycle that you can now control. So by default, as in JNet4, every test method will get a fresh instance of the test class, which in usually is, is, is quite fine. It provides perfect isolation. Um, you don't have to worry about state, as in this example. So if I execute this now, so you will see, it will fail, right? Because this test happened to be executed first, which added an element to the list, and this one removed the first element of the list, which was then present, because it reused the same instance, because the list is an instance variable, after all, right? So this is the, the kind of pitfalls you can fall into if you use this per class instance lifecycle. The reason we added it for some integration tests, it might make sense, and for example, if you use Kotlin to write the tests, Writing static um, static methods is not really easy in Kotlin, not nice. So um, using this lifecycle, um, you can, for example, use before all methods and don't have to make them static. Actually, I've never seen su such a method. Um, how do I fix this? I can move the initializer to a setup method. And what I usually do, I give him a better name because it doesn't have to be setup. And this is now also has a different name. The before each annotation used to just be called before in JUnit 4. Um, now it's called before each. So now when I run this again, it will work. OK, another new thing. We now have tags. So you can uh, tag your tests. So for the sake of an example, I'm just going to tag this happy path and this one edge case or something like that. I mean, this is now a string, no longer a class literal. So if you know JNet4 categories, you had to define classes for your categories that were essentially empty and made it harder to reuse tags across sub-projects because you have had to have this common place uh, where you could reference all the categories from. Um, why is this useful? Well, you can now create a configuration, for example, in IntelliJ. Ah, I prepared something here to only execute like the happy path tests. And this will like find all the happy path tests, all the, the tests that are tagged with happy path in your project and run them. You can do similar things in, in Maven and Gradle. So if you like have like UI tests and integration tests and regular unit tests mixed in one test source folder, that's for example a use case. Or you could tag like features all kinds of things. Um, it's up to you, basically, how you use this. All right. 
so this is a short recap slide. I told you everything, so just for the sake of having a short reference, what I talked about, you read this um, again, maybe at home. The same is true for display name generators. They're in use since 5.4, and I've shown you the replace underscores one. There's not that many built in right now, but you can write your own. Yeah, test method ordering, we've also seen that. And as I've mentioned, there's a method order right interface that you can implement and also um, implement your own ordering if you really need that. Yeah, Kotlin support is, is a first class citizen, so you can write all tests also in Kotlin, um, which makes it a little bit easier sometimes if you just want to have white space, for example, in your method names in, in Kotlin, that's perfectly fine. You just have to use these spec ticks here. Um, we have a couple extension methods, for example, for assert throws, where you can use reify generics um, and pass a simple Kotlin closure here uh, instead of wrapping things. Um, so that it, that it feels uh, more Kotlin-like. Yeah? And the same is true for assert all, which is an assertion that um, allows you to check multiple things and check all of them, even if the first one fails. All right, we've just seen simple tests for now, um, but there's more things. And I prepared something here. Yes, let's do this one. Um, they're called math tests. And in this first one, I'm just testing the square root function in Java Util. And for such tests, sometimes you want to have multiple inputs, basically, yeah? You don't want to just have one example that you test, but multiple things. Um, for example, for square root, you could test like, hey, I want to check that the square root of 1 is 1, of 2 it's 1.41, for 4 it's, uh, for it's 2, for 16 it's 4, and stuff like that. So instead of th the test annotation, we're using parameterized test here. And we can customize the name of each invocation of this parameterized test. And then, in addition to this annotation, we have to write one source annotation here, for example, in this case, the CSV source for comma separated value, um, which is, yeah, basically this is one line in, in a CSV file, um, comma separated, and this is the next line. Um, there's a lot of other source annotations that you can use. Um, it's extensible, so you can write your own as well. When we execute this, we will get four invocations and the name will be picked up from this pattern here, basically. So square root of 1 is 1, of 16 it's 4. Yeah. Can we use the file? Yes, yeah, there's also a CSV file source. I didn't get that part. Uh, it's a, I mean, it's CSV file source. Um, it's, it's a class path resource, basically. Yeah. So if it's in source test resources, just the file name, basically. Yeah. Um, what I like about this one is it's visible in the test, right? It's not as I mean, it's it's, it's halt, it's strings. It's not perfect, but that's all of Java really offers us in annotations. So we went for that syntax. All right. Next different way of writing tests is the repeated test annotation. I, in this case, I this is a, a test method where I'm checking that math random returns zero with a delta of 0 0.9. This is, of course, a completely made up example. And it will fail in about 10%-ish of cases. So when I run this once, it might be green. When I run it the next time, it might be red. And this is what we call a flaky test. Um, of course, I'm pretty sure all of you have seen flaky tests like that, for example, integration tests that depend on lots of things. And sometimes you suspect something is a flaky test, you would just want to run it a bunch of times um, to kind of get a better understanding if your suspicion is correct. And that's where repeated test comes in very useful. Um, so if I run this, you get 100 repetitions of this test method. And as you can see, some fail. So it was 12 out of 100 here. Yeah, so this is sometimes useful if you want to debug something like this. Um, just run it a bunch of times. Okay, last but not least, this is com a completely different way of writing tests. Um, this method is not a test. 
it's a factory that produces tests. So it returns a stream of dynamic tests, could also be an iterable um, or a collection. And in this case, basically what I have here is the actual test. So I'm saying this is a dynamic test because it doesn't exist statically. Usual, usually test methods are known once the test class is compiled. This one is dynamic in nature because it, it's generated at runtime during test execution. And I have two parameters here. The first one here is the name of the test. So in this case, I'm testing integers for being even. And uh, I'm generating basically the infinite stream of all even integers and limiting it to 100. And this part here is basically what usually would be the method body of a test method. And I'm asserting that if I do modulo 2, it, it's 0, right? So if I run this, you will get very fine-grained reporting about all of these numbers. And these names are basically picked up from here. Yeah? This is a really, really fast way of programmatically creating test tests that are reported in a very fine-grained fine -grained way. So short recap, parameterized tests, you can use different source annotations. Um, we've seen CSV source, but there's also CSV file source, and there's method source that, that you delegate to a method, um, either in a test class or some other static method in a different class. Um, of course, it's extensible. You could um, yeah, implement your own arguments provider here, or even your own annotation um, that does something and has some parameters that you can then read in your implementation. Yeah, there's repeated tests for flaky tests, and there's test factory to produce dynamic tests. Another new feature in 5.3 is parallel test execution, which is not enabled by default. You have to opt in. And one way to do so is having a JNOT platform properties file. Uh, this is here in source test resources. And um, once you have that, you can enable parallel test execution, which is this property here. And also, you can change the default execution mode. By default, if you don't have this property set, it will run everything um, sequentially because it allows you to opt in on a test class by test class basis that way. But you can change the default to concurrent here. So now if I do this, these two properties, everything will be run in parallel, or at least will be attempted to run in parallel. So let me go back to um, the, the test factory that we've, saw, that we've seen. Um, so this one is probably too fast, so I'm going to add a thread sleep here to make it slower. Of course, you wouldn't do that in a normal test. Um, so let's run that. And as you can see, eight tests run in parallel. So instead of taking 500 times 100 uh, milliseconds, it, it's quite faster. Um, one thing you can't trust IntelliJ's uh, yeah, reporting here anymore right now. It's kind of, it's a bit broken. But you can see down here that for most of these, it's not broken. This one's one millisecond, but yeah, sometimes IntelliJ gets confused a bit with the numbers, but the reporting otherwise is, is fine and works. So what we've done here is um, executed the tests in parallel. Why eight, you might ask? Well, the default strategy is a dynamic strategy, so we can specify a factor, and that factor gets multiplied with a number of local cores, and this happens to be eight on my machine here. So by default, it will try to use all, all the cores um, on your CPU, on your machine, um, to run tests. But you can change that. You could say, like, I, I want to use twice as many or something like that, for example. Or you could use a completely different strategy, for example, this fixed one. Um, and this means, okay, I want to I wanna set a, a fixed level of parallelism I want to use, and I want to set it to 16, for instance. And if I do this, and I run them again, you will see it's 16 tests in parallel. Because these tests don't really do anything, but sleeping, um, yeah, it works fine even on eight cores. 
So you have we have some control over that, and you can even, if you want, implement your own custom strategy um, to configure that. Um, there's a couple things like the parallelism level is not the only one. You can configure the threat pool, um, how, man how many threats are there at maximum, and stuff like that. All right. Yeah. So one thing I didn't show, I actually wanted to show that. Let me do that real quick is um, you have control. Um, you can change the execution mode not only in the properties file, but you can uh, say execution same thread, for example, on a test method or on a test class um, to signal, OK, this test class should not run in parallel. So if I do this, then again, it will be sequential. Yeah. So you can really play with the default. You can opt in on a test class by test class or test method by test method basis. It's all up to you. And there's even a resource lock annotation that allows for uh, declarative synchronization. Um, so you can define like a string which describes a resource that you want to use in multiple tests. And the framework then ensures that uh, no two tests that have conflicting access to that resource run in parallel. That's another new thing that we added. Um, and for all of these things, the same is true. We are looking for feedback. So if you use that stuff and run into some limitation of it, please let us know. OK. Any questions so far? No? OK. Then I'm going to go into uh, extensions a little bit, um, which were one of the most important things that we designed for to be extensible, um, because there's just no way we can, as a JNet team, satisfy everyone. Um, so basically, everything we do is extensible. I, I think I stressed that already a couple times. So let, let's see a demo. OK. So this is the simple example I've made up. Um, this is a test that currently fails. And um, wouldn't it be nice if I have this annotation, like, I don't want to run this test on weekday or on, or on some weekdays, like on Saturday and Sunday, for example. Um, of course, this is a made-up example, so take it with a pinch of salt, please. Um, this could be anything, right? This is just a custom annotation here. It lives in the com example extensions package, and yeah, its value is just an array of day of week uh, constants, the enum from Java time. And of course, right now it's disabled, but if I Remove this and run it. It will fail because you know the fail method is called here, which says fix me. So I need to do something if I wa wanted to implement this as an execution condition for tests. So I would write an extension for that. And how do I do that? I use the extend with annotation. So I can use disable on weekdays extension as a name. And I create that class in the same package. And what it does by default is it says, OK, you have to implement extension. And as you can see, it's not read um, because extension is simply a marker interface. There's no methods here I have to implement. If, I lo if you look at the hierarchy, you see, OK, there's quite a lot of interfaces um, that I can choose from. I can, of course, also combine them. So I can implement multiple of these interfaces in a single extension. But for now, I'm just going to use one of them. Namely, I'm going to use the execution condition one. And most of these interfaces have a single method that you need to implement. In this case, I have. I'm implementing a condition, and the condition can be evaluated. And as a parameter, I get the extension context. So the extension context is kind of a description of everything that I currently have in my test. So what, what test am I about to execute? What's its display name, for example? What's its annotated element, like its class or its method? Um, what are its tags? Um, what's the test class I'm in? What's the test instance? So everything basically that I know um, is provided to extensions here in the extension context. Okay. So in this simple example, um, all I need really 
is to look up the annotation on, on the test method in my case. And to do that, there's a class that can help you that's called annotation support, which is part of JUnit. Um, and you can get the annotated element out of the context and look for our annotation. This returns a optional of disabled on weekdays, so of, of the annotation. So if it's present, I'm going to get its value, which is you know the value of the annotation here. And once I did that, I'm going to convert it into a list just so I can work with it more easily. And then I'm going to filter. I'm going to check if the current date day of the week is in that list. For that, let me maybe do this today equals local date. Now get current no the day of week. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so I'm going to check the weekdays in here if they contain today. And if that's the case, um, I want to disable the test, right? So that's where the result here comes in, the condition evaluation result. It's basically a Boolean with a string. So it's, a, it's, it's disabled or enabled and with a reason. So in our case, um, it should be very simple. We don't really need the value. So we're just going to say um, disabled. And we're going to pass uh, car today is as the reason. And that reason gets reported, as we'll see in a second. So disabled, I'm going to statically import that from condition evaluation result. OK, that's the case of where it's actually in there. In all other cases, I'm just going to say it's enabled. So I'm just going to use or else get here, and I'm going to say enabled. Enabled also takes a reason. I don't really care for that reason. Um, there's no tool I know of that reports it, so I'm just going to use null here for now. And yeah, basically I need to return that. That's it. Yeah. So we found the annotation, we extracted its value, converted into a, into a list, and then checked the listed weekdays um, if they contain today. And if so, we're going to disable the test. So now if I go back here and run it, you will see it's now disabled and it says today is Saturday. So that's the reason we specified in the extension. Of course, this is a made up example. Um, in reality, you probably would check something else, um, some state somewhere else, if, if this test maybe is quarantined or something like that. Uh, that's uh, basically all you can write in Java, you can write in that extension and have uh, any logic you want. Okay, so the extend with annotation and this one kind of, yeah, I mean, every time you want this annotation, you also want extend with disabled on weekdays extension. So instead of writing it here, I'm going to cut it from here and move it into the annotation. Because all the annotations in JNet Jupyter are supported as meta annotations. So you can compose your own annotations and in this case make it shorter on each test. So this basically will also register the extension. So if I run this again, it will have the same result and it will say today is Saturday here. Yeah, so that's just a convenience feature. Um, you can use that in any way you want. Okay, so I've shown you the extend with annotation for registering extensions. Um, you can use that on classes and on methods. There's also a way to register extensions that are fields, so like instance variables. You can use the register extension annotation for those. And you can also do it globally using the service loader. Um, That's an example in the user guide. That's the extension marker interface, um, but please remember in one extension implementation, you can implement as many of these ex extension interfaces as you want. It's all, um, we take extra care that we don't have any overlapping method names and stuff like that. 
Um, you can compose annotations af as we've seen. Um, you can even take this further. Like can, could like add another annotation here. And basically in all the places we have this annotation then it's the same as we had all these annotations as well. Okay. There's a long list of extension points. Um, so you can hook into the lifecycle using the before all and so on callbacks. Um, we've seen execution condition. There's also a way to resolve parameters for test methods. Um, that's also extensible. You can create the test instance. Um, you can post-process it, for example, to inject fields and stuff like that. There's a test watcher since 5.4 that lets you uh, react on the results of tests. And there's test template invocation context provider, which is by far the most complicated one of these, which is used to implement actually parameterized tests and repeated tests. So even that is extensible if you want. You can define your own way of parameterizing tests if you need it. Since 5.4, um, we have a, a built-in extension for temporary directories. So this is also implemented as an extension. And it looks for parameters of test methods that are annotated with the temp dir annotation and will just create a temp directory for you, inject the, the path or the file for you, and then you can use it in your test method and it will clean it up afterwards. There's a couple of built-in conditions since 5.1, so we can enable or disable tests based on the operating system, the Java runtime version, system properties or environment variables. We don't have one for weekdays, sorry. There's a wiki page for third-party extensions um, where we collect them. So if you see something in the wild and it's not on that page, please add it. If you write your own extension, please add it as well. Um, so there's extensions for Spring, for example, um, for Mokito, for test containers. Um, all kinds of extensions are there now. And yeah, we think this will really grow over time and um, yeah, are interested of course to find new extensions. So please let us know. Okay, this concludes the first part of this talk, um, how we can write tests and extensions using JNet5. Next up is the JNet platform. And a short explanation why JNet actually is a platform in our point of view. Um, actually it has always been a platform. So JNet was like one of the first testing frameworks for Java, and it has great integration into IDEs and build tools since the start, I think. I think it probably predates some IDEs even, so they had that from the beginning. And other testing frameworks have used that, of course, as well. They have written runners to be able to run in those IDEs and build tools on top of JNet. And build tools and IDEs has have also found uh, creative ways to work around certain limitations. Um, so it's this, this one draw file of JNet4, and basically, as a maintainer, you have no idea who uses which parts, or which internal APIs, or even stuff is accessed via reflection, and so on. For example, stuff like this, like you have fields that have this F expected prefix, and we wanted to rename them to modernize the code base a bit in 4.12. So we removed the f prefix of f expected to expect it and so on, and it broke basically something. As it, it's sometimes it, it was really really a pain, and this is why we decided okay this coupling has to stop. We really have to design for JNet as a platform. We have to put some some more thought into it. So we came up with these different concerns that we wanted to separate. First of all, we've already seen that the Jupyter API to write tests and extensions for test authors. But at the same time, we also wanted this thing to be extensible. So um, we don't want to hard code forever what a test should look like. And now it's this new API. But maybe, I mean, in two years time, we might have a different idea of how a test should be written. And we want to be flexible. We want to be able to reuse the platform. And this is why the test engine SPI exists that lets you write yeah, your own test engine, basically, which is a mechanism to discover tests and to execute them. And last but not least, the Launcher API is our abstraction that IDEs and build tools are using um, for calling the platform. It's completely separate from the API to write tests. So the desi design goals behind that were flexibility. So we wanted to be able to add new features to JUnit again without this big, headache every time. 
Um, at the same time, we wanted backward compatibility, so we didn't expect anyone to, from one day to the other, migrate all their tests from JNet 3 or JNet 4 to JNet Jupyter, so we would should still be able to run the old tests on the platform. But at the same time, we wanted, in the early days at least, to be able to provide people a way to run new tests on in old tools, <laughs> like a way to write JNet5 tests and run them in IDE or in a build tool doesn't actually support that. This is the big picture what we what we ended up with. Um, so we now have two test engines. They're called Vintage and Jupyter. Jupyter is the new one. Already talked about that. The Vintage engine allows to run JNet3 and JNet4 tests on the new platform and um, you would just use that in your tests. You would not have any dependency on the platform. But IDEs and build tools on the other side, they would. They would only depend on the platform and more precisely on the launcher API to actually orchestrate the execution of tests. At the same time, this is open for other third-party frameworks. So we didn't close this down. The test engine SPI is open and we will see an, as an example in a short while that this is actually happening other test frameworks are using this. So if I talk about JNet5, there's really no such thing. It's three parts. It's Jupyter plus Vintage plus Platform. That's the three parts that comprise JNet5. Yeah, so there's some compatibility migration. Um, of course, you can run tests on the platform, all tests. I talked about that. JNet4 categories are mapped to tags, so you can still yeah, keep referencing those categories if you want. There's limited support for JNet4 rules. Um, the new extension model is completely different than the old one, so we couldn't support all the rules, but there's for certain subset of rules, there is a way to make them run with JNet Jupyter tests. There's support for the ignore annotation, so you don't have to replace that with disabled right away. Um, yeah, and IDEs also provide tools, like in IntelliJ you can just like, there's a quick fix to migrate a JNet4 test to a JNet Jupyter test. And there's also a community provided migration tool on GitHub, which I've linked here, that lets you do that for the whole, for your whole code base, if you want. Of course, it's not 100% perfect, and this works for, yeah, for most cases, but probably not for the 20% of the cases. That's something to keep in mind, of course. Build tools, um, yeah, we have, Great support by now, there's native support in Gradle and Maven. Um, for other build tools, we have a console launcher, which we provide as a standalone jar. Uh, so basically, it's just Java minus jar, and then you specify the console launcher, and then you can basically run tests on the platform. And this is really easy to integrate into any other build tool or whatever, right? This is the way out if you have a build tool that doesn't support it yet. As far as IDEs are concerned, um, I think there's excellent support by now. IntelliJ and uh, Eclipse have been supporting it for a long time. Uh, Visual Studio Code does, and uh, NetBeans 10 also now does support it. And this is the, the forward compatibility I talked about. So we've written a runner that you can use to run new tests that are written for the JNet platform on JNet 4. Yeah, I think I'm going to need five more minutes. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so third-party engines, as I told, uh, as already mentioned, there are some by now. So, uh, for example, for Kotlin-based test frameworks, there are some. For Cucumber, there's one. And there's also some other others for Java, like jQuick. And we collect them on the same wiki page I mentioned before. So please do add them there if you find something else. And now I'm going to do a short demo, really short, um, of multiple engines in one project. So this is the Gradle build script. I'm using Vintage here, and Jupyter, and jQuick, and Spec, and I could add more, of course. And I have a bunch of tests here. Some are written in Kotlin, some are in Java, and I can just execute that and wait for compilation. And it fails, of course, because I made it fail. So uh, for jQuick, um, which is a property-based testing framework. Beyond the scope of this talk, very interesting. Um, yeah, it just returns false, so it's always kind of, it will always fail. There's a Gen3 test in here that calls fail. 
and there's a Jinit 4 test that calls Jinit 4's equivalent of fail. There's a Jupyter test that calls Jupyter's equivalent of fail. Um, and there's this, this back test, which is a Kotlin, um, which also well chooses Jupyter here. But yeah, basically all, all of them fail um, because I wanted to show you that here. And what you get on the top level, you get a node for each test engine. So it's kind of, it's grouped. Um, IntelliJ hides that by default if there's only one test engine, but if there are multiple, you can see that here. All right. Yeah, one thing this allows is, since everything is run in a single test run, you don't have to worry about like performance and stuff, and you can mix those freely, and it allows you to gradually migrate from one <coughs> testing framework to another, if you want. Or you can just like live bef with your JNet4 or JNet3 tests forever and write new tests in JNet5. Yeah, another new, new thing in 5.1 are tag expressions, um, which you can use in your IDE or in your build tool. Basically a sophisticated expression language which you can use to select which tests you want to execute. Um, it's like for and 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 negate things here. Um, we support Java modules since 5.1 actually, so if you are using that, you can, uh, for example, execute all tests in a module or scan the module path um, using the console launcher. This, this is the standalone jar I talked about previously. So that concludes the second part, and now just some links left, and then <laughs> the conference is over, basically. Um, so roadmap and resources. What's still to come? So we're currently working on um, making test discovery reusable. This is mostly interesting for test engine authors, so not for the average user. Um, I'm also working with um, Leonard Brunings on, on Spock 2.0, which will be based on a JNet platform to leverage its parallel execution support and uh, that kind of thing. Um, from a user perspective, more interesting is um, there will be a way to um, actually customize how a test is executed for example, in a user-defined thread. Um, that's an interesting requirement. For example, if you um, want to use the event dispatch thread of, of Swing or something, you have some old-school application that uses native Java UI stuff, for example, then you need that. Um, maybe more interesting for most people will be that there are global or declarative timeouts. Um, right now, we only have an assertion that you can use to time things, to time out based on how long something takes. There's no annotation or anything like that. We will add that in 5.5. I'm currently working on that. And there will also be a, a global configuration parameter where you can set like the default timeout for all test methods. Um, so you don't have to repeat yourself. We, we desperately need a new reporting format. The old XML-based one is just not good enough. Um, we have so many new things we want to include, like tags, display names, report entries. Um, so we we are going to need a, a new reporting format, and that is something very high on our agenda. Test suites as well. Currently, there's um, not really a way to do that. A test suite is something where you can like, define programmatically which tests should be executed, kind of a set of things to execute. You can like kind of emulate that using a launch config in IntelliJ or a, a custom test task in Gradle, um, but there's no test suite support right now in on the platform. We want to change that. And also test classes cannot be parameterized right now, only test methods. That's also something we want to add in the future. And of course, it's an open source project. So if you have other ideas, please let us know. Here are some resources to get you started. The user guide um, is very extensive by now. So that's a good starting point. If you want to get your hands dirty right away, there's uh, sample projects for Ant, Bazel, Gradle, and Maven uh, in the Jane 5 samples repository. Of course, there's Javadoc for all public APIs. If you want to read some more details about how things work. What we want from you is basically feedback. We want to know how you use features, which features you use, um, what you have problems with. Um, so these are a couple links where you can ask questions. For example, Stack Overflow is a good place if you just have a, a beginner question about how something works. There's probably someone in the community who can answer faster than the JNet team, so that's a good place to start. Um, if that doesn't help, of course, feel free to open a GitHub issue, or if you have a feature idea right away, do that. We are on Gitter, so we can chat with us. 
Um, and if all that is too much, we have a Twitter account, so ping us there. Yeah, one short advertisement here. Uh, so you can support JNet. We actually started collect collecting donations a while ago. Um, as you might know, JNet is not backed by any company or anything like that. So that's the way we're experimenting with to, uh, yeah, to get some more time to actually spend working on JNet. The example code for today is already on GitHub, so you can check that out if you want. Um, yeah, and of course, if you have some questions, feel free to ping me. I don't think we have time right now for questions, but feel free to come just up front here and we can discuss, and I'm here the rest of the day. Um, yeah. Okay, that's it for me. Thanks.